Hey, everybody, welcome to today's episode of the Law of Self Defense from the road. So, this is a pre recorded episode. It's not our usual live stream. Um, that's what happens when we're traveling. We get these shows done when we can. And right now, I can. And what I'd like to share with you today some interesting video footage captured of an expert Brazilian Jiu Jitsu fighter, professional MMA fighter. Um, applying those skill sets, those barehanded fighting skill sets, when he finds himself at 4.30 a.m., oh, dark 30, being attacked by an aggressor wielding a very large knife, about a foot long knife. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about kind of the the legal dynamics around the use of BJJ in self-defense and how those varies in the context of when a defender is facing a deadly force attack in particular. With that introduction out of the way, let's go ahead with the formal launch of today's show. All right, welcome back. Welcome back. Of course, I do have to mention the sponsor of today's show, which is none other than Law of Self Defense itself, specifically our free book offer, our best-selling book, The Law of Self-Defense Principles, a real physical book. Check it out on Amazon.com. 1,500 reviews, I think, five-star rated, but don't buy it on Amazon. Amazon will charge you for both the book and the shipping and handling. We only ask that you cover the shipping and handling. We'll give you the book for free. And there's the URL right there, free copy of The Law of Self-Defense Principles book, lawofselfdefense.com slash free book. When you go there, by the way, you'll also have the option of getting audio versions of the book, even a video version of the book, if that's your preference. Learn more about all of that, but definitely get this book for free at lawselfdefense.com slash free book. It's your handbook to how to make yourself hard to convict if you're ever compelled to defend yourself, your family, your property against criminal predation. Again, lawofselfdefense.com slash free book. Now, today we're here to talk about this gentleman, Xavier Baez, uh, apparently a uh, professional or has been a professional MMA fighter. I think he says in the the news report he's had five or six professional fights, Uh, clearly very skilled at what he does. I don't think he's a very big dude. I think he's like five foot and a few inches, Uh, but obviously extremely capable of defending himself, including defending himself against a knife attack, an attack with a very, very big knife. Apparently he was out, I believe this might have been Halloween night. It's about uh, 4 a.m. according to the video footage, which we'll watch. The footage itself is only a few seconds. Basically, it shows the aggressor with the knife charging at Baez and Baez successfully taking the defender to the ground and inducing him to give up control of his knife. Uh, Apparently, this is actually the second confrontation um, between the aggressor and Baez um, the first one also involved a knife, but then for some reason there was a there was a break in that initial encounter. The aggressor uh, obtained a second knife, and that's the fight we'll see resolved here successfully by Baez. So I'll share that video clip with you right now, um, and then I just have a few talking points. Short show today, folks, a few talking points about BJJ, deadly force attacks, and how the how the law looks at these kinds of uses of force. So here's that video clip. We'll see the aggressor coming in from the left, from the left with the knife in hand. We'll see Baez more or less in the upper right. Um, And here we go. There's the aggressor. There's Baez backing up, backing up, backing up. Then he comes in, seizes control of the arm. Bam, takes this guy down. Big knife there and manages to seize control of the knife. So that's the only video I have there, but it does have a happy ending. I believe the aggressor was arrested by police uh, and Baez was um, essentially uninjured. I think he got a few scrapes just from going to the, you know, a parking lot, uh, which is not to be unexpected, Uh, but he was not stabbed by the knife. Now, this is a nightmare scenario. Uh, I don't care how good you are at BJJ, Uh, someone's coming at you with a knife, it's a nightmare scenario. The the prospects that you're not going to end up getting cut are are pretty low. You should expect that you're going to get cut if someone's coming at you with a knife. Um, Fortunately, that didn't happen here. 
but few of us, I would suggest, even those of us who study BJJ, uh, have this level of skill. Certainly, I don't have this level of skill. Um, so very, very nightmare scenario. Most of the, the well-known BJJ instructors who've done like YouTube videos and how to defend yourself against a knife attack will typically recommend you simply run away from a knife attack. That's the most prudent way to defend yourself. Uh, of course, is a knife attack a deadly force attack? Yes, of course. So would that privilege you to use deadly defensive force? If the other elements of self-defense are satisfied, yes, deadly defensive force would be a proportional response to a deadly force attack. So had Baez here had a gun on his person, would he have been privileged to use his gun, deadly defensive force, to stop this knife attack? Sure, that's probably what I would have done. I, I don't have the BJJ skills to otherwise defend myself against a knife attack with my bare hands. If Baez had had a knife, would he have been privileged to use a knife to defend himself against this knife attack? Yes, that would be a proportional deadly defensive force response to a deadly force attack. More to the point here, uh, the news reports indicate that Baez did not, in fact, cause this aggressor any significant injury. He just submitted him in the classic sense of uh, inducing him to give up control of the knife, maintaining control of the suspect until uh, police arrived. <clears throat> there are, of course, uh, many techniques in uh, jujitsu that can readily inflect, inflict uh, death or serious bodily harm. Uh, now, that's not the intent of BJJ techniques for the most part. Um, even a choke, for example, uh, the intent generally not to kill the person with the choke, once they've lost consciousness from the choke, which happens in six to 10 seconds, uh, then you would release them and secure a position of safety. And they would promptly recover from the choke, regain consciousness, and they'd be fine. More to the point, of course, there's a variety of, of joint locks, right? Ankle locks, arm locks, kimuras, Americanas, um, where the general intent, certainly in the dojo, uh, once you get those in place, those submissions in place, uh, you expect the person you're working with, you're training with, to tap out. That's what I'll do. Because if the use of the technique continues, uh, that ankle or knee or elbow or shoulder gets destroyed. The joint is simply ripped apart uh, from the leverage and pressure that BJJ can apply. Um, so you would never do that in the dojo. Um, ideally, you wouldn't do that in competition. The goal of competition is not for people to get seriously injured. But in a self-defense scenario, you might find yourself having put an arm bar on an aggressor. You got it all locked in. In the dojo, you'd apply maybe a little bit of pressure and you'd expect the tap. But what if in this case, you're, you've put an arm bar on someone who the arm you're controlling has a 12-inch knife in it? Can you simply let that person tap out? Now, if you do use BJJ to destroy someone's ankle, knee, elbow, shoulder, to rip that joint apart, have you used deadly force? The answer is yes, because deadly force includes not just force that can kill, but force that can cause serious bodily injury. And destroying someone's joint, folks, loss of a bodily function falls squarely within the definition of serious bodily injury. So if you carry those techniques through to completion and destroy the joint, you have used deadly force on that person. Even though the prospects of killing them may be zero, uh, the serious bodily injury is sufficient to qualify the use of force as deadly force. Of course, you're allowed to use deadly force in self-defense under particular circumstances, in particular when you're defending yourself against a deadly force threat. So if you have this aggressor with a 12-inch knife and you've managed to get control of his arm, the arm whose hand is holding the knife, and you've got him in that arm bar, can you just let that person tap out, let them get up while they still have the knife in their possession? I would suggest no, right? They just tried to stab you with it. Uh, would that be a circumstance in which you could legitimately Break that person's elbow if necessary for you to take control of that knife. Yes. Yes, when you break the elbow, you're using deadly defensive force. But the knife, of course, is a deadly force attack. So we have the conditions of proportionality there. So <clears throat> I often caution uh, BJJ practitioners to be very careful about using some of these techniques. Because if you use these joint-destroying techniques to destroy a joint, 
and you were not facing a deadly force threat, well, then you've gone disproportional. You've used deadly defensive force under circumstances where it's not legally permitted. And if you go disproportional, if you use deadly defensive force when you were not facing a deadly force threat, you lose the required element of proportionality and you lose self-defense. You can't justify that use of force as lawful self-defense under those circumstances. And that's not good. So <clears throat> having said that caution, because we, we mostly, I think, for the most part, imagine ourselves using BJJ to defend against a non-deadly force attack. And if that's the case, you don't want to be using an intensity of BJJ that would qualify as deadly defensive force if you're facing only a non-deadly force attack. But there are circumstances, like in this video, where you may find yourself using BJJ to defend against a deadly force attack, and in which case you would be privileged to use an intensity of BJJ that would qualify as deadly defensive force, force capable of causing death or serious bodily injury. So, um, another issue I wanted to touch upon here, um, we sometimes heard have heard the expression where someone has an exceptional fighting ability, particularly boxers, right? Boxers, uh, do they have to register their hands with the police? Are their hands deadly weapons? Uh, are they held to a different legal standard than someone who does not have that exceptional fighting ability? Um, so it's worth touching upon that here. The, the answer is yes. You are held to a different standard. Now, do you register your hands with the police? Of course not. Are your hands registered as deadly weapons? Of course not. But the power of and the damage that can be inflicted by the blows of a professional boxer are orders of magnitude greater than what a punch delivered by a normal person can be expected to inflict. Um, a normal human being, two normal guys, uh, their accountants or whatever get into a fight outside of a bar. They're throwing fists at each other. Um, the courts invariably treat those fists, a traditional fist fight between two men of similar size, strength, and fighting ability as a non-deadly force fight. Not a deadly force fight. Um, now, we know sometimes barehanded blows do kill, but it happens so rarely in the context of how many fists are thrown every year in America, um, so out far outside the normal context for a traditional fist fight in which normally no one dies or suffers serious bodily injury, that the courts by default will treat a traditional fist fight, traditional fists thrown by normal people without exceptional fighting ability as non-deadly force. And one of the reasons they do that, besides the one I just pointed out, it's, it's not the norm that someone would die or suffer serious bodily injury from a traditional fist fight, is if the courts were to treat every thrown punch as deadly force, then they'd be giving permission for every fist fight to be escalated into a gunfight. Because if every fist that might come at you is deadly force, well, then you'd be privileged to use deadly defensive force, your gun, to defend against your fist. And the courts just don't want to do that. But there are aggravating circumstances that can make a thrown fist something that is likely to cause death or serious bodily injury. It could be a, a disparity of size. So the person throwing the fist is much larger than the person they're trying to punch. It could be a disparity of strength. Um, it could be a disparity in fighting ability. If one of the men has an exceptional fighting ability that the other does not, that professional boxer, that golden glove boxer, their punch is not the same as the other guy's punch. It is a much higher degree of force, arguably one that is likely to inflict death or serious bodily injury. And that professional fighter, that professional boxer is going to be held to the standard of, of what their conduct is likely to result in. And if, they're, if their fists, if their techniques are likely to inflict death or serious bodily injury because of their exceptional skills, that's the standard they'll be held to, as opposed to the lesser standard that someone without those exceptional skills would have. Another way exceptional finding ability can come into play, legally speaking, is not just how much force you're using, but also how much force you need to use. And remember, the need is not being judged by you. It's being judged by other people the police, the prosecutor, the judge, the jury, it's their perception of need that controls your legal outcome, whether or not you go to prison for the rest of your life, potentially. Uh, and the way this can come up is if someone, if a defender has an exceptional fighting ability, um, for example, here, this MMA fighter managed to defend himself from a knife attack with his bare hands. I would suggest most people can't do that. Most people would be privileged to go to a gun under these circumstances. But if this guy had gone to the gun, 
Say he has another encounter like this a year from now. Again, he's attacked by someone with a knife. And this time he goes to the gun and shoots that guy. Might a prosecutor argue that, hey, listen, if a normal defender was attacked by a dude with a knife, a normal person would be privileged to use a gun to defend themselves. Deadly defensive force against a deadly force attack. But this particular defender we know is capable of defending himself against a knife attack without having to use deadly defensive force because we have video of him doing it. His exceptional fighting ability means it's not actually necessary for this particular defender with these skills to have to use deadly force in self-defense under these circumstances. And therefore, if it was not actually necessary, he can't be justified. And you may think, well, it's ridiculous. No, no prosecutor would ever make an argument like that. Well, they do, and they have. So in the George Zimmerman trial, where George Zimmerman defended himself against the beating being inflicted by Trayvon Martin, Trayvon Martin was mounted on top of George Zimmerman and beating Zimmerman's head into a sidewalk with his fists. Um, George Zimmerman pulled his pistol, fired a single nine millimeter round into the chest of Trayvon Martin and killed him. And that was lawful self-defense as a judge by a jury that acquitted him of all charges in his trial. And one of the arguments the prosecution made in that case was, well, listen, maybe, maybe a normal person who's getting their head beaten into a sidewalk in a sustained beating of this type, um, maybe a normal person under those circumstances would be privileged to use a gun in self-defense, but not George Zimmerman. Why not George Zimmerman? Because <laughs> sometime prior to this event, George Zimmerman had become concerned about his weight. He was pretty overweight. And he had decided to go to a gym and get fit and lose weight. And the gym he decided to go to happens to brand itself as an MMA gym, mixed martial arts gym, a fighting gym. And the prosecution argued, hey, George Zimmerman was a trained fighter. We know because he went to this MMA gym. And therefore, he had an exceptional fighting ability that meant it was not necessary for him to use a gun to defend himself. He had the barehanded skills to defend himself against Trayvon Martin's attack without having to go to the gun. And therefore, the gun was not necessary and therefore it was not legally justified. Now, <clears throat> fortunately for George Zimmerman, uh, the, the owner of this gym was brought in and explained to the jury that George Zimmerman's fighting skills, actual fighting skills, were laughable. I think he said on a scale of 1 to 10, it was like a 1 or a 1.5. So clearly, per the testimony of the gym owner and one of Zimmerman's fitness instructors, Zimmerman had no fighting ability, much less an exceptional fighting ability. So that blunted this argument by the prosecution, but the prosecution made the argument. So again, if you have an exceptional fighting ability, and by the way, I want to make sure everyone understands. I'm not telling you not to acquire an exceptional fighting ability. I myself study BJJ. It's better to have the skill set so you're better able to survive the physical fight, right? The physical fight's the most important thing. If you don't survive that, everything else becomes less pressing. But as you're acquiring those exceptional fighting skills, be aware that the law will judge you differently, that, that techniques you're using, punches you're throwing, may be deemed to be more forceful than they would be if they were being thrown by someone without that exceptional fighting ability. Uh, the, the reasonable perception of a threat against you may be perceived differently in your case because of your exceptional fighting ability than they might be perceived um, on the part of someone who doesn't have that exceptional fighting ability. So, you know, get trained, learn BJJ, wh whatever, whatever unarmed skill uh, you prefer to learn. I encourage you to know at least one, um, but also be aware that the law will take that exceptional fighting ability into consideration when evaluating your use of force in self-defense. All right, folks, I think that's really all I have for everybody today. Again, I'm on the road. I'll be on the road for a few days. I'll, I'm going to do my very best to uh, do these shows from my various hotel rooms. This show happened to come to us from Amarillo, Texas. Uh, tomorrow, I'll be in Oklahoma City uh, meeting with uh, the CCW safe folks. Really looking forward to that. Uh, and then I'll be moving on from there. So until 
Until we meet again, hopefully tomorrow, I'm planning to do another show tomorrow. Until we meet again, I remind all of you that if you carry a gun, so you're hard to kill. If you carry a knife, so you're hard to kill. If you study BJJ, so you're hard to kill. Carry pepper spray, so you're hard to kill. Whatever you do, so you're hard to kill, so your family is hard to kill. And I do all those things. So then I'm hard to kill and my family is hard to kill. Well, you also owe it to yourself and your family to make sure you know the law. So you're hard to convict as well. Until next time, I remain attorney Andrew Branca for Law of Self-Defense. Stay safe.